Hey everybody, this is Brian the Yellow. On episode number 67 of Origin Stories on Creativity, I spoke with Ken Scholes. He's an Oregon writer. I think he lives out near Portland and was kind enough to be on the show to discuss his writing career. He's been writing for, oh, a little over two decades now. And he's extensively published. He says about 50 short stories and he said about five novels published in his series. My son has gotten me sick again. It's a lovely, nice little respiratory ailment. He coughs, I cough. He sneezes, I sneeze. We are simpatica. Ken Jules is interesting because he has had the type of career that a writer seeks, wants, published, awarded, recognized, appreciated. And he's now willing to take a look at it, step back, and, and basically say he wants to try something different. He's still writing. He's still looking at his, uh, his collection and going, what more can I do? He's working. He's being a father. He's living his life. And he was willing to be on my show. And it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking with him. And I hope to have him back on. Talk about his future work in PTSD. He's been published in Tor. He's been published in Clark's World. I mean, his resume is extensive. He's got the type of resume that people want. And, you know, I'll let him go ahead and discuss it further. I was in the Army and the Navy, both. You were in the Navy as well? Okay. I was just in the Army. Where were we stationed? I did uh, did, uh, Navy time... um, San Diego, uh, it was just boot camp and AIT. Well, not AIT. It was Seaman Apprenticeship Training. So I get my Army Navy stuff mixed up. I was there for three months active, and then I was drilling. I was a reservist and finishing my senior year of high school. And the Army recruiter showed up and had this awesome college offer, and I really wanted to go, um, wanted to go full time military after school because I hadn't figured out what I was going to do. I had a, I had a weird life, man. Um, I was, I wanted to be a preacher. Right. I started wanting to be a writer and then I wanted to be a preacher like with with, I mean, I studied I burned my D&D books and sold off my SF collection and and started, you know, buying theology books at 17. And um, and so I was going to go to Bible college and that was going to cost because it was more expensive than going to like, you know, a state state college. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my dad didn't want to pay for Bible college, so I needed more college money. And then so the army had this much better deal. And um, so I, I talked to the army and they said, oh, no, we can get you out of the Navy and into the army. So I, I ended up with two honorable discharges. Um, There's nothing wrong with that. Cool, right? Yeah, no, I went, I, I did a year in the Navy and then I, you know, with only three months of it full time. And then I did two years in the army and then came home and went to college. And, well, and became a youth minister. So, I mean, I was like a... Uh, let me set this timer here because we're cooking calzone now. <laughs> Did you end up being a chaplain's assistant or go back in the military? No, no, no I was a supply clerk, and um, I uh, and then because I, you know, I, I thought about becoming a chaplain. I thought about re-upping and becoming a chaplain's assistant, and was moving in that direction, but then decided to just get out, go home, do the uh, you know do you know start college. I landed a position as a youth minister. Um, and so I was doing a whole different thing, right? I was writing Christian music and playing guitar and singing and writing sermons and studying theology and was licensed to be a minister when I was, ooh, I was 20, maybe, 21. And then I was ordained. A, a church called me to be their pastor while I was finishing college. And I was, uh, I, I was 24, but I was ordained by a council of ordained men who you know, sat me in a room and asked me lots of questions. And, and I went up to Bellingham, Washington, and finished college, got a history degree, thinking I'd go to seminary, um, and pastored a church, and and I was, um, 
a long, I mean, it's a long time ago, right? This, they're talking the early 90s. And then I, uh, I got, I wrapped up college, but in the midst of college, the first symptoms of my PTSD kind of really emerged. Mm-hmm. And I went into this deep depression and I didn't understand what was happening to me. But my, my wife at the time, my first wife, uh, who was, you know, kind of with me while I was pastoring the church and all of those things. She worked for a doctor and he, he, uh, he saw me and he diagnosed me with depression and he suggested that I probably had PTSD based on what he had heard of my childhood uh, and suggested therapy. And these of course were all things I was writing off. I wasn't gonna do that, but he, had, he gave me medication that I started taking. And I, you know, I didn't want, I had a huge cognitive dissonance between my faith as a kind of more fundamental leaning minister and then, you know, psychology, which of course was suspicious, um, you know, in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, the medication was helping. And then I eventually I did step down from the, the pulpit, decided to take a break from being a pastor and get this all sorted out. And then, I, you know, ended up not going to seminary, uh, ended up um, going into therapy where I started journaling a lot, you know, just lots and lots of writing. And all of that writing, the further I kind of moved as I, I, this is when I really started growing, I think, you know, there was a kind of slow evolution as I moved away from that really black and white, um, deeply entrenched way of looking at things, right? I mean, there was no evolution, um, six day creation, you know, all of those things were, were I, I saw them as truth. So uh, this was, you know, even in college, I wasn't really challenging things, but I started the challenge when my PTSD symptoms first started to emerge and I had this depression that I couldn't shake and my faith wasn't, you know, my faith certainly wasn't bolstering me as much as it could. Now it did, I mean, it certainly, it was a, it was a great life raft that carried me through um, some of the hardest times of my life, but uh, eventually I, I found a better path. Um, Were you always a hardcore believer, even as a child going into the military uh, and the Navy? I was when I went into the military, sure. I mean, I was raised to believe that it was true by people who weren't practicing you know, what they, what they preached. Uh, but then I really took to it in my teen years. Um, and I really wanted, um, when well, I know why, I mean, right. I grew up in a really tough place. Our PTSD came from, you know, being raised by a borderline mom and an alcoholic stepfather and a distant father and, you know, a horrible combination of abuses that took place, you know, all throughout my childhood. Um, so, you know, there's a lot there and which goes, of course, was unrecognized and undiagnosed, untreated. Um, you know, there was, and so, I was carrying this big bag of rocks around um, yeah, for years. And, um, but then it, was, it started to really hit in college. Um, and yeah, I had, so I had this huge faith, you know, all the way back to my earlier years, but it hadn't been, I wasn't, I wasn't in church all the time as a kid. I mean, I didn't start going regularly until my teen years. Um, but yeah, it became what, a core part of my life. Uh, Southern Baptist is where I landed as a, oh, where I a was tough one. a pastor. Yeah, well, I <laughs> they mean, don't like it when you ask. <laughs> they don't like it when no, you ask questions. I mean, they're basically they're a large, line, aren't well, they? Yeah, no, it's a the Bible. Yeah, the, there's a it's a largely literal Bible is the Word of God group. Uh, you know, and of course before that, I was in a much deeper um, and, and even more right wing. Uh, there was a General Association of Regular Baptists, and then there was just the kind of the you know I don't know any hillbilly Baptists, right? They're with the the King James only, and uh, you know a guy that taught me to. Pre- one of the early guys that taught me to preach, uh, he learned, he learned, he only learned to read uh, on his mama's knee so that he could preach the word of God. And it was the only book he'd read. And Are so, you Oregonian from way back when, or did you come from someplace else? I, I'm from Washington. I actually grew up you in the Mount Rainier, but it's a, it was a little mine or a little logging town. So it was very, uh, you know, it's we so had odd to me I, thinking I was, about Washington as yeah. this blue haven on a map, there you know, are. being so liberal and, but it's really, as soon as you get away from like Seattle, the Puget Sound oh, yeah. area, it really does get very conservative. Yeah, the it? states, it's, if you look at the states from the standpoint of, of population centers, you'll see where the blue is. Uh, I mean, it's, but I grew up, I grew up rural and, and very, um, you know, I, I call myself a redneck. I grew up in a trailer, you know, where we had car parts in the yard. And I mean, it, it was, it was something. Um, but yeah, what do you no, think it faith... was in college that huh? kind of shook you? Besides the PTSD, you're studying oh, history. That... You're studying. Yeah. I mean, what what kind of history were you looking at? Was it just kind uh, of religious history or world history? World history. Yeah, I was looking. At, I was in a secular. I was in a secular college, right? I was at, at Western Washington University, and I was just studying this huge overview of of um. Those cougars, right? Of history. Pardon. Uh, cougars. Yeah, what? 
the state no, university the, or the Vikings? Uh, the Vikings, was, oh, okay. Uh, Western, Western, Western. Washington, oh, okay. Which is up on, it's up kind of near the Canadian border. Oh, uh, so gotcha. I was just studying, you know, I was studying kind of world history in general and a little bit of comparative religion, but no, I don't think it was that. I think that what happened was that what I, I think that, that what I was hanging on to, you know, the raft that I was using, um, you know, could only carry That's me so small. far before, yeah, because yeah, the, and it wasn't so much the cognitive part, it was the emotional part. It was, you know, there was this huge deep depression um, that was you got really woke, rocking. Right? Yeah, <laughs> Is that what well, the I kids think so. You it, got woke. <laughs> well, kind of, yeah. And I got, I really, it, it, it took a while, right? So I, I slowly, I don't have one of those sudden, oh, then, then the next day I was an atheist. Uh, no, I, it was this very slow migration. I was, I landed in a kind of a less uptight, kind of group of, of Christians for a while. And then eventually yeah. I was confirmed an Episcopalian and I was still out practicing, you know, doing, I was, when I was starting to sell my first short stories, uh, I was still out practicing my faith and still conducting funerals and weddings and, you know, doing those bits. I, it's funny. I've talked to some, I was just talking about this not too long ago. I was uh, uh, early in the early days when I first started selling short stories. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the, you know, kind of religion in science fiction panel. And then in later years, I was on it as an atheist. So it's been an, it's been a really interesting kind of journey there. But, but I eventually what happened, I forgot where I was headed earlier, but I was talking about all the therapy. I was doing the therapy and I was doing all this journaling for therapy. And then when I hit kind of this plateau where things were evening out, I had all this time on my hands. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing as much of the, I wasn't doing the ministry stuff anymore. Um, I mean, I was still doing the, the, doing things as needed, but I wasn't out actively preaching or doing my concerts or any of that. Um, I started writing again and I started writing short stories again and I started putting them in the mail again, like I had done back early in high school before. This I is early nineties, right? <laughs> Uh, I would have been 97 is when I finally got serious about writing again. Uh, 96 is when I took my first stab at it, or maybe 95. And I took a couple of little stabs, but I started really like cranking out the short stories in and putting them in the mail and having a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet of where they were going and how long they'd been there uh, in 97. So 20 years. So that's a different world. Right. I mean, huh? in terms of uh, looking at the time frame of 97 to 2007, I mean, wh what would you give to go back to that era of fiction, speculative fiction and start publishing? Again? Oh. oh, no, I don't think I would. No, I, I, no, I would. I, you know, I, there's not much. I would, might go back in time as a tourist to see shit, but I wouldn't go back to do anything. <sighs> So do you think we're living in a better era now as a writer than than then as a writer? I don't know that there's I don't I think that you're just you're in an era and you're a writer. You're and just you're in, in an era. era that you're you're just in the era that you're in. I mean, it's my writing is going to span my, my I started writing before I had a computer. And I was do you think that there were better and... platforms to get published then than there are now, or is that a ridiculous question? Because you could tell me if it's ridiculous or not. I just have this well, theory that you know, Facebook I think it's just different, hit, right? I mean, were... we have this – the world's very different. When I came back to writing, um, yeah. I don't know what, if I would have – if I'd had access to indie publishing that wasn't the kiss of death, um, I might have caved and started putting my own stuff out in the world. Yeah, sure. right. Um, I don't know. I, I you know, that's I think, the massive excuse, it, isn't it? It's like, it's oh, I'll just be an indie yeah. publisher. <laughs> well, there you can. It's it. It becomes at some point in time, you get tired of the rejection, right? But I, for me, I just I only had it in my head one way because we didn't. You know, Vanity Press was that we didn't have Amazon Kindle and the you know all mm -hmm. KDP and all that stuff. Um, so, what were you writing you know, in uh in the the late to mid nineties? Oh, my, my, my body, I mean, a lot of my body of work ended up getting, I mean, I was writing sh speculative short stories to see a lot of, a lot of practice stories then. Um, but I had written a couple that and eventually sold. Um, I was writing a mix, some horror, more horror then than, than I've probably ever written since. But of course I was also, you know, coming out of a pretty intense therapy time, mm -hmm. <laughs> writing quickly became therapy. Um, and I, uh, so I mean, I was writing, but I, you know, I, it was back then that I, I mean, 99 is when I wrote Edward Bear and the Very Long Walk, which is the short story that I'm probably most known for. Um, I mean, a lot of my early successes, um, you know, came in just a couple of years after all of that. And 
Um, let's see, what else? I mean, I was writing short stories. There were a lot of, there were some pastiches, right? Where I was doing Robert E. Howard knockoffs and trying to, I get, I did my evil bastard gets his just desserts story that you have to do. Uh-huh. I did my Adam and my Adam and Eve on another planet story that you're supposed to do. You know, all the, all the, all the you know, I didn't do any talking cat stories because that's one that, other, you know, you also were supposed to do at some point, I guess, but I missed the memo. You're supposed to do a talking cat story. So, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, there's this list, right, of stories that you write when you're a beginner, when you're coming uh-huh. into it, and everybody just does it as a part of their rite of passage. And they don't even realize until after they run it through a crick group, oh, yeah, no, these are the kinds of stories we have to write and get out of our system. Um, but, you know, I, I was, you know, I, I don't know, I was digging in. Um, I was digging in and I was full of fire, right? And that, that was. That, you know, there's a lot of energy and a lot of passion when you're when you want to break in and you're you're kind of you you equate that as kind of a finish line when in reality it's just getting you know qualified for the race. So Edward so, Bear and the Very Long Walk was published yeah. a few times. It right? came out it in was... 2001. Yeah, it came out in it came out the first time in 2001 and it came out in 2004 and then it came Tall out in Bones Ohio. in spring Kill 2001 Bones. and then Kill the Kill best Bones. of the rest three. Yep. I mean, you have a Wikipedia page, which I have. <laughs> is yeah, pretty it's impressive. Getting, it's actually you, it's getting updated. It's getting uh, it's getting worked on. It's been I can't work on it myself, but I have a yeah. friend. Yeah, I discovered that the other that you can't touch it. You can only you can ask people to do something for you, but you can't yeah. touch it yourself. It's somehow they know. For a work over. Yeah. I guess somehow they know. It's very impressive that you have a Wikipedia page, and you asked me a question when I we were talking back and forth not too long ago about how I ran into you, and it was actually the anthology that I think you most recently were involved in, David Boop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Straight out of Tombstone. Okay. Yeah. And that was yeah. art that was associated with the cover that just blew me away. And I started oh, looking yeah. through it and I saw your name yeah. and then I started looking through your credits and uh-huh. I reached out to you. <laughs> oh, okay. That's what it was. Okay. I, cause that's I, my what, first... what happened. And you were kind I enough to reach yeah. back to, or you, you, you responded to me and then we started a conversation. So it was a miracle because I'm never on Twitter. I just, I've been recently popping back on there because Janny was saying nice things or pointing out something. And, and so I popped on and, um, and I saw your note and I thought, Oh, I better get back to this guy. So <laughs> that's so cool. It's so cool. And you're like, uh, um, I mean, this that was such a fantastic book. I don't buy anything anymore. <laughs> I have a list. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like got a hundred freaking books in it right now that I want to read so badly. And I'm yeah. reading. I don't know if you know it. Sapiens is a um a, a book on uh, the history of humans from mm-hmm. you know the beginning of Homo whatever's no but that sounds it sounds interesting <laughs> oh my god it's so I interesting to... i'm like 20 yeah, percent through it what's what that audible has it i wonder if audible has it i've got extra oh credits god. at audible that they're telling me i need to use so <laughs> i cannot um, i cannot finish anything i have twins they're two and a half years old and my time is just oh dude uh, dude welcome to that club are they identicals or are they uh, are they fraternals and they're fraternal a boy and a girl. Okay, I've got, I've, yeah, I've got daughters. So mine, are, mine are eight now. I, I think oh. if I had um, twin girls, my life would be easy. Huh? It's my oh, son. No. He beats yeah, me no, no. all the time. I just wear oh, well. a pillow around my crotch. <laughs> <laughs> the dick ah. just goes after me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that might be. Maybe it is the male. I don't have males. I have, I have and I, they're awesome, but they, they can be, um, they can, they have, they bring their own trickiness. Um, <laughs> they are definitely, they, they, they are full of emotions. And, he wants um, to make sure he's the last of the male line. I yes, swear, to yes. God. <laughs> he's already figuring out. He's already figuring out the you know how to get the throne. Around. I will be the last. <laughs> right. will be the last of my line. But, uh, my daughter is so wow, sweet yeah. though, and she'll play by herself, and she'll come over to me and feed me her little plastic food, and I'll be like, "Oh, this is so sweet," and my son will dive bomb me from some secret area that he's discovered. Blam! And I'll be in pain the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yep, nope, I haven't had that. I, I, they don't attack me, so we, we, I do have that going for me. So eight-year-old little girls, my goodness. Yes. You've survived. <laughs> I have, and I'll tell you, man, that you're in the harder parts. I mean, I, I, it was, I thought it was really brutal until about age three. Uh, but when I discovered four. your name four on this list. started getting better. 
that book has been on my list that I've wanted to read, and I'm I was just looking at it before I got on the the call with you. And it's like oh, I want to read this so bad. It looks so good, and you wrote it with somebody. Um, what was his name? How was that to write with somebody? Are you talking about the short story that's in the anthology? Yes. Okay. So, I, yeah, the collaboration. Well, I mean, that one was, I mean, it's hard to, I don't know. He, he had a start on it and he sent it to me and I worked on it. And I think we, I, I don't, I don't honestly remember. It was kind of right after I finished the last book of my series and I had just moved um, like the last time ago. Um, and I was, not, I was like really kind of had lots going on. Um, I just remember we passed it back and forth. And I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things where he had already, I was trying to get back to work and he, he had bought stories from me for his name's Brian. He's a Brian spelled with a Y as well. Okay. The right one. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so he, um, and so he had been invited and he asked me if I'd be willing to work on this one with him. And, you know, I, I, he'd bought stuff from me before and I, you know, we know each other. We, um, uh, so I thought, oh, oh, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I don't really remember a whole lot about the experience. It was just kind of, it was the last thing that I did though. The last thing that I did after finishing my series. Um, so you're, you're but done, I have done with that series that you've been working on for, I'm done for, yeah. uh, God, what it's been since 19. 19- uh, it, I finished it all within a decade. Within a decade. I started it in 2006 and I closed it out in 2016. Um, and now it's coming out in December. So, And that's yeah. all you've been working on in terms of novels for the last uh, 10 years. Yeah, that's the only novel. I mean, that, that Lamentation was the first novel I'd ever written. And I wrote it on a dare thinking it was a practice novel. And I never imagined that it would get turned into a five-book series. I, a practice I, novel. <laughs> it's my practice novel because I, I, I had one Writers of the Future in 2005. I had a dozen short stories in the small press, mm-hmm. you know, so I was still qualified for Writers of the Future, which is a great contest for people who want to. Write. Oh, that's a Scientology um, contest. I've well, submitted I, work to that. It's, but it's, it's, I, it's not really a Scientology contest. It's, it's L. Ron Hubbard's contest because he founded it, and it's, I, you know, it's run by Author Services, which is largely staffed by Scientologists. But it's actually it's not. It's owned by the science fiction community in a lot of ways. The money comes from Hubbard's financial, his, his literary uh, estate, and then it's judged by like Orson Scott Card. I think Rob Sawyer's on there. All the you know, oh, Jerry really? Pornell was on there until he passed away. All, yeah, it's the top names in science fiction who are the judges. So uh, I should when stop. I, year, uh, <laughs> I should start. Well, I should continue to send fiction. It makes me feel so icky because of the the stuff that's happening with science Scientology lately. Well, I mean, I I, I think there's that's the, it's yeah. I mean, you've got to you and you have to follow your own conscience, right? Keep in mind that when I started, I I I did not submit for years because of my faith. And I didn't mm-hmm. feel that I could do that. And then it was pointed out to me that it was one of the top markets in the field. It's a respected market. Um, the judges, it's, it is judged by, by people in the science fiction community. It's not all, all that happens. The, the, it's not an, it's not a church function, right? These, these are, these people happen to be Scientologists and this is the job they do, but they're running this, they're running the kind of administrative side of it, but they're not, they're not the ones that are deciding who wins the awards. Um, and then the money, of course, comes out of his, his literary stuff. I, I found it; I, it was a good experience for me. I, I, I that's what know, I've heard. I'm, I'm, like that I'm will make secular, people's career. It, it's helped me. Um, I'm a secular yeah. humanist, right? So um, I find I find all religion to be something that we've cooked up, you know, to, to help ourselves feel better. And I don't have a problem mm-hmm. with that, as long as as long as it doesn't involve putting people in fireplaces and shit. Um, <laughs> Right. I, I think yeah. that it's, I think that if people if, if that whatever people choose to follow, as long as it's not harming anybody, um, you know, I think that, and that's where you, the lines get blurry. Right. Yeah. But, real blurry. But at the same time, when you look at all of the different the, the kind of makeup of the people um, that judge it, there's all different groups represented in the in the science fiction and fantasy world. And it's no, it's really good. It was a good market. It was a good launch. I'm still friends with most of the people, you know, I mean, I, I we interact. We, you know, I, 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 I love my group that I came through with. Um, it did help launch me. My second sale after that was the short story that turned into two short stories that then I got dared to turn into a novel. And that one of the short stories came out in realms of fantasy. Um, and I have the artwork from it, um, here in my living room because the artwork from the short story sale inspired 
the larger story that later turned into the series. So. Do you find yourself writing um, stories inspired by art often, or is that one of the few times? It's happened, yes. Well, I think that when I was, when I was, more, I, you know, I've been on sabbatical now for a while, and I don't know exactly when I'll start up again, maybe January. I've said yes to some short stories that aren't going to be due until spring, so we'll see. Um, when, when you mean sabbatical, but, what does that mean exactly? I, no novels? I or? have not. The last thing that I wrote was that collaboration with Brian. Um, and I haven't done anything since I've not been, I've not, How's that feel? it's been, a, uh, it feels fine. I mean, I, I, I just, it just, it'd been 20 years and it felt like I was, um, I needed a break. Uh, and I wasn't sure if I was done, done, or if I was taking a break. So I've just decided to err on the side of I'm taking a break. <laughs> so wh how does it feel to be 20 years looking at your career now? I mean, it's hard lately because you could pretty I'm, much not make any money and still be successful in today's field of writing yeah. well I'm, I, mean, I mean i'm yeah i i i don't know when i look back and i'm proud of my body of work i've got over 50 short stories out there in the world um and they've been all collected up nicely most of them there are a few that haven't yet um and i've got you know a series of five novels that i'm i'm proud of and i think you know even though i didn't i didn't like lamentation when i first wrote it and i didn't understand what the fuss was about i've grown to love the series and you know when i was getting ready to wrap it all up i had half a book left to write and i i um plugged myself into the audio versions and listened to the first four books mm -hmm. uh, all in a row and it was amazing to because it took me completely out of my own head because I wasn't my book anymore. It was the voice actors who were act who were you know reading the parts, and that made the it made it gave me a chance to experience my story, and then that prepped me to huh. finish the last half of the last book. But I was in the middle of the half. Of, I was I stopped because my best friend Jay um, died of cancer. Oh. When I was halfway through him. And I'd been, you know, this whole series had been marked with that, right? My mom had died in the middle of the second book. My dad had died in the middle of the third book. My, um, I, I, my stepmother, I think, died in the middle of the fourth book. And my father-in-law, too, somewhere in there. Uh, and then in the middle of the fifth book, my best friend died and my marriage died. So, uh, so that was, it was, it was pretty hard hitting, you know, 2014 to now have been pretty tough. And I, you know, I was full-time um I, I was i was on kind of a five-year plan to get up get my writing revenue up where it needed to be but it became pretty clear after three years that that wasn't going to happen and then that gave me one year to kind of be with the girls through that you know through a summer um and then go back to work so i went back to work uh in at, at multnomah county go about a year ago a little over a year ago <laughs> and so everything's you know the clock's been reset right i mean i'm mm -hmm. no longer full-time i'm back to work I've got my kids half the time and I'm, you know, and I'm settling into this new town. Um, I'm playing music once a month, but I, you know, I have, and I could write, but I just haven't had anything I want to say. So I don't know. I'm proud of what I've done and I'm pretty sure I'll be back potentially doing young adult stuff um, maybe for a little while. And then, you know, short stories. I don't know. I don't know. I might, I might strike out under a pen name and not tell anybody what it is. I haven't decided what I'm going to do. That's interesting. So do you feel weighed down by the last 20 years of your writing career? Like there's an expectation there that you're not really satisfied with? Hmm. No, I mean, I used what I had. It was an expectation of myself that was unrealistic that I was, I mean, I was, I was beating myself into a frenzy trying to figure out how to, how to make a living with this. Right. Uh, uh, how do you make a living yeah. with it? I mean, I'm, well, you know, I 10 years younger that, than you and I don't have a clue. I mean, some people what's do. His name? I mean, it, Scalzi, you obviously know who John yeah, Scalzi John. is. John Scalzi. Yeah. He's incredibly successful and he's given his stuff mm -hmm. away for free now too. I mean, how do you make a living with this stuff? I mean, well, I mean, it, you, you, you can, I mean, there are people you, it's just, it's, it's a combination of working hard and being, and being seen. <laughs> And some of the being seen you have control over and some you really don't. I mean, there's a word you have to, the really successful books are word of mouth, right? It, and it just sweeps through and you just don't know when it's going to happen. I remember when we were all gearing up for lamentation, there was a lot of talk that maybe it might happen. Lightning could strike here. There was a lot of setup. Um, yeah, for the, that lightning striking, right? I mean, it's such yeah, a horrible yeah. phrase because then it's like, it's out well, of it your is. hands. <laughs> well, there's an element of it that really is out of your hands. And I think that- What you know, is that- been, uh, there's a tiny the black man comedian. What is that dude's name? If I just say that, does a name pop into your head? Because he's not no. popping into mine. Anyway, he's in movies now. He's really incredibly popular. Yeah. 
and um, you know, the movie studios are like, okay, we want you to market this thing. He's got, you know, hundreds of millions of people following his Twitter and his Instagram. And there's no reason other than, is it lightning? Cause he doesn't say it's lightning. He says he's got the skills to market himself. And that's why he has hundreds of millions of people following him. And, and it could be, uh, you know, I, I don't, whatever it is, I don't have that skill. Anymore. I don't have it either. Cause uh, as I'm listening to this podcast and they're saying this about this person, I'm like, you know, how does that happen? I mean, yeah, what dial do I have to twist inside my brain to have that happen to my social media, which makes me sick. Cause I really don't care that much to have it happen. I say so many dumb things that I'm pretty sure well, if I had that many people following me, it would immediately I, blow up and I would regret it. Well, and I don't, I just don't need it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I've got, I've got my kids, I've got my job, I've got my writing, I've got my music, I've got the people in my life who love me, the people that I love. I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of... Why, um, why did lightning you strike to begin great. with? I mean, what was the original intention, uh, I mean, like, back in the 90s? Why did you want to write? What was the oh, well? I mean, it was before indi- that, right? I was I was writing before I could type. I was I have a box of short. I had a dozen rejection slips before I started preaching, from when I was in high school. Um, I was compelled. I mean, there was a compulsion, right? I needed to tell these stories, and I had the same. In, in you know, and then it became what this was the compulsion. Well, like, there was wow. a self exploration. Um, later when after after therapy i was able to kind of look at my stories and see kind of what was going on a little bit under the hood right what's whatever mm-hmm. the things that were popping up in my stories that were off but you wanted to know, share that content. too it wasn't like journal journal was, journal hide under the bed journal 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 okay publisher share this with other people well but i i you know i started writing short stories i mean i wasn't really sharing journal entries I no no i understand stories, but, but i'm saying why you do you at, share you, it why why do you want it, the it, audience it was, i do the same thing right i share i want people to read the art I, the only answer I i've ever picture, been able to come i want to put with, it up on a wall why the only, only yeah the only answer i've ever really come up with is because that's the way that ray bradbury did it and i was following ray Bad- what bradbury said. said four fit stories a month and then he wrote, yeah, he'd write it, send it out and get it and get, get it, you know, put it in the mail and write another one and put it in the mail and write another one and put it in. So right. I was just doing, I mean, that's what I, you did to be a writer. I thought that's what you did to be a writer. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know why I did it before, but I know that I don't, I, I'm, I am re-exploring the whys and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this next time out will be a little different than the last time out because i don't care about you know like for instance the the events and getting out to conventions and those sorts of things i used to go to all of that and i just i don't care as much now i i'm more interested in being home with my kids and you know i was spending thousands of dollars at one point going off to all of these things to promote my work and make business contacts and all that and i i think it was really important at a certain stage but now the more they pay off at the end of the day right i mean yeah right well now i just if i'm going to and now I, if I write it, I'm probably going to find a place to sell it. And it's just a matter of, do I want to write it? And if I decide to, then I'll, you know, I'll get back to it. I'm hoping that I'll, I'll want to, because it's a nice part-time job, right? And it gives you great write-offs for traveling, for research and all that good stuff. But we'll see. So I, I mean, a lot of big expectations of myself around all of that. So I mean, what else is that in. that thing where Ray Bradbury did say write four mm-hmm. pieces of fiction a month, but what else was he writing there to get that stuff published in the magazines? In, in what way? I guess I – mean, Who was he, he writing? He was writing 1,000 words a day. He was writing 1,000 words a day and putting in – I suspect that he was – I know he was hanging out with uh, Lee Brackett because they lived near each other. I think he, hang, he hung out with the writers in the L.A. area. I don't know. I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't know for How sure. How were you getting your stuff gather. published? Was it just quality of work, or was it that you were talking to the right people at the right time? I guess be, oh. I, mean, I guess I'm picking your mind for myself huh? and other writers who are trying to sure. get their stuff into magazines. Well, I mean, it's, it, yeah, I, what I did is I used Raylan.com which is, you know, right out there. Rayland.com is a great market source. I think it's still up and active. And I would identify my markets and I would get my story off and I would try and match it to the best market, you know, based on what they were, you know, said they were looking for. When I went to conventions, I would make sure that I met the editors that were there um, and got it, you know, went to their panels and listened to what they talked about, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they saw too much of. Um, I would talk to them. Um, and, you know, mostly it's, 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 <laughs> There's no, there's no secret to it. There's no trick yeah. to it. It's just persistence. It's, and it is, it's a combination. Yeah. Meeting the right editor at the right time 
can be great, but if your work stinks, it's not going <laughs> to not going to publish a story they don't like, right? And and, it, and the other thing that's crazy about it all is that it's very subjective. One editor may love a story and think it's amazing, and another editor may think it's terrible. And so you just, I mean, so I try to I try really hard to divorce myself from all of that. I don't worry about any of that. I just it doesn't matter. I don't have any control of it. I, what I do is if I'm going to write a story, usually these days I'm getting asked, hey, we'd like to have one of your stories for this. Okay. That's the best place to be, right? Right. It's great. Really, yeah, I like it. I'm not working hard. you know. And if I write a story, I may not necessarily just send it off. I may just leave it until somebody asks me for a story. Because I've, <laughs> I've just, I'm, you know, I'm not in that stage now where I want to put my stuff. You know, I just don't. I, 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 mean, I don't. I'm looking at your my credits. List. You didn't send this stuff to Tor, did you? And Tor asked you for it. Which? The, the Tor.com stuff? Yeah. Some Near of it 2011. was. Um, yeah. Well, like, uh, well, yeah. Some of it I was asked for, but others of it, no. Some of that was that I'm Tor. I'm a Tor author, and I and the editors who buy for Tor.com are Tor editors, and they all met me in 2007 around the lamentation stuff in 2008 and and so they basically at that point in time you know i i uh, was asked i think as a matter of fact i think the weekend that i was off um in new york first meeting some of these folks i was basically told if you have any short fiction that we might want to look at let us know huh, um and so and fairwood so I, is a tour imprint no, no, Fairwood is, Fairwood is, um, no, the tour.com is tour.com. What happens okay. is my short stories will come out at whatever venue, what, whoever, like, for instance, um, Straight Out of Tombstone has a collaboration with Brian. Um, or, you know, it'll come out in Writers of the Future. I had a story come out. Um, or Realms of Fantasy or any of these other places. And then after enough of those have been out for a while, um, I'll go to Patrick, who's the editor at Fairwood. Now, now, keep in mind, the reason I know Patrick is that Patrick was the editor of Tailbones Magazine and the editor of Fairwood Press. He owned them both. And so Tailbones was the magazine, Fairwood Press was the book side. And when he, 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 I first started submitting fiction again, I was sending to him first because he had an email submission and nobody else, everybody else was largely mail it. You got to put it in the mail. Mm -hmm. So I'd uh, go to him because I could get it emailed and then I would go everywhere else. So he, um, and then he taught a class. So I went and took the class. And in that class, he made us write a story every week that we were in the class. And then he critiqued it. He told us everything that he would want to do different. We all pitched in and critiqued each other's work. Oh, that's nice. And I sold my first sale was one of the stories that I wrote in that class. And he told me in class, send this to the pro markets first, the ones that pay the best. And if none of them take it, send it to me. So I sent it to the pro markets first, like he said, and none of them took it. So he paid me a penny a word for it. And that became my first sale. There's that a was huge, in the year 2000. There's a huge market out west, though, isn't there? In your area, Portland and Washington, Well, I think it's Seattle I think there's area. A market. I don't think it's just the out west. I think there's a market for short fiction online and in print. But I don't uh, – it's not um, – a lot of it's small press. A lot of it's – you know, it's not, it's not going to be the place to go – if you want to be able to, you know, pay all your bills, right? But yeah. It's, it's, but it kind of comes down to, um, but yeah, I think there's still, I think there's still a great market for short fiction and for long fiction. And then on top of all that we have nowadays, you can go and self, you can indie publish things and it's not the kiss of death anymore. Um, it's not it, the kiss it, of death, but you really have to work your butt off, don't you? You can't, you can destroy well, your career by making the wrong yeah. decisions too quickly. Yeah. And I, I, I just don't, and I just don't want to do all that. I mean, I, I'm, I am not. That was one of the, the 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 turning points for me. Was when I was looking at. I was sitting down talking with successful indie writers and what they were having to do um, in order to get by, and then some pro writers that had gone indie and were never coming back. Um, and just looking at all, what all of that was, yeah, uh, and the, the amount of work and the effort, and then looking at my eight year old daughters and my full time job, I'm very content right now, right, to just mm -hmm. write when I want to write and then throw it over the the wall. And, you know, I, I think I'll get back to doing the long stuff sometime after the first of the year. Um, but even then, I think it's going to be shorter, long stuff. I'm going to be looking at maybe a young adult market. Um, and, you know, I'll put my stuff, I'll start with the publisher I already have. And I've got, I mean, I've got an agent, I've got a publisher. So it's just a matter of the writer doing his part. And I, you know, once I'm ready, I'll just, you know, I'll throw my hat back in the ring. But yeah, I don't, I don't feel that need anymore, right, to, to, 
I don't need to go make a bunch of money. I don't, I am done trying to make my writing do that. I just, I want to get back to the place where I really enjoy storytelling. And if Did I you, get paid um, for it, yay. Yeah. Did you enjoy writing uh, long fiction as much as you loved short fiction? Because I get that sense that no. you really love short no. fiction. Short well, fiction I had a lot of time. I've written, I've written probably over 100 short stories, right? I've mm -hmm. sold 50 of them. Um, I've only written five novels. So I feel like, you know, it's like, well, ask me after I've written another 20 novels. I, the the risk like reward that. was more beneficial for short, right? I mean, you, you sent every other story, mm -hmm. came back and said, ooh, add a boy. And the novels. You did if they were so buying them. Yeah. It did if they're buying them. If they weren't buying me, I had 75 rejections on my short fiction before I'd ever sold anything. So, I mean, it took a while. It took a while for yeah. me to get the, uh, the you know, to, and then in the first couple of years, it was like sell, reject, 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 and then a sell. You know, I might get, I had like three sales between 99 and 2001. Um, I mean, and then when it started to really go was about writers of the future time and yeah. so that also my friend jay lake right when i looked at it about two-thirds of the body of my work was either inspired by my friendship with jay or he asked me for the story because he was editing a project or any number of i mean but connected to him and somehow in some way so and were you guys communicating via the internet or were you guys in town together who can pass work well, back and forth and personal oh we, and, well we were we were we didn't we were um we were uh, you know we chatted a lot but we also we had lunch every week i mean he mm -hmm. was he would come pick me up at my office and we'd zip down the road and eat and uh talk writing talk you know love life talk everything um so he but so so in the week you know i i think i did i looked at a few things for him i um you know some short stories and some i think i read a, a couple of his novels when they were in draft um but it's very uh, difficult in my to life, have a uh, a writing friendship where you don't feel that that com competition where you could cheer each uh, other on and you're like oh man yeah. i hate this dude came up with such a great idea or yeah yeah we used to get some i mean we never i mean everybody has a little bit of that i guess from time to time i but it was never you know it, it never i don't I mean, there were moments i'm sure where it probably i don't know it it was one of those things where it just kind of came with the territory right there are certainly mm -hmm. writers that feel insecure um or competitive and some are more so than others and there are moments sure there are moments when you know jay would get invited to something boy i wish i was in that but you know you just okay i didn't get invited <sighs> to that i'll probably yeah. get invited to something different um and it's you know you just kind of you know a, lot, a whole lot of life gets easier if we dial down all of the expectations that we generate on top of this existence we have, right? Mm -hmm. we, and you said we, Jay and passed, this is, right? Yeah, Jay died of cancer in 2014. And that was, uh, you know, of course, and that was uh, in the midst of my PTSD stuff, right? I had, my PTSD was um, there and I wasn't really, I wasn't acknowledging that I had it because um, I still was just, you know, I didn't believe the doctor and I, I didn't believe it until my kids were born. And there was this huge resurgence of it, which now I know is an, kind of a normal thing that happens with kids who are abused. Um, when they become parents uh, or when their parents die, they often have more pronounced symptoms that show up or if there are other big life changes. And so these huge symptoms rolled in in 2009 and 10 and that were largely debilitating. So I had not only you know all these people dying around me, which were tr kind of triggering more because one of my early uh, losses in life was my brother when I was four. Um, so... So I had all of that going on. Plus, I had newborn twins. I was waking mm. up in a cold sweat with my uh, my arousal system fully on, you know, in fight mode or flight mode without yeah. remembering what was going on. Right? I would wake up a wreck. I, I was, you know, having to tranquilize. Uh, and and I ended up finding this. Uh, I found I discovered by, you know, over just a uh, kind of digging in. Oh well, looks like I do have PTSD. It looks like that's what's what, what's happening here. And then I've discovered. Uh, after, you know, a stretch of wondering what the hell was going on, I, I found this doctor in Chicago that does, um, he was doing an experimental treatment using a pain block called a stellate ganglion block. That's a, it's a, it's like an epidural to the neck. They do it for back and neck pain, shoulder mm -hmm. pain. Um, but he discovered that it uh, eradicated PTSD symptoms. Interesting. And, and so in back tracing that, the belief this you know that they're trying to test out is that it somehow reboots the amygdala and turns off the panic signal by sending by anesthetizing the nerve growth that the that is uh triggered 
in the ganglia, uh, the sixth, um, the C6. Uh, Is this a uh, reoccurring uh, treatment, or do you just need? It was. I went. I went five times over the course of five years. I think. Wait, four years. I went. Started in early 2011, and my last treatment was January 2015. The January treatment uh, was a dual injection and he used pulse radio frequency instead of a kind of general anesthetic mm -hmm. um or whatever i don't know it was a uh, lidocaine or something um but they he used this pulse radio frequency and for whatever reason well because it was he hit all, all he hit both sides of the amygdala and it was it was a complete game changer i mean i had I'd already seen huge results from the first four blocks. I mean, all the symptoms would vanish for a long stretch of time. Um, but in this case, not only did the symptoms vanish, but I instantly had my, my cognitive capacity um, was kind of significantly stretching between each block. But at that point, I had a big kind of a, my, a big aha moment when I saw the patterns in my life and the patterns in my marriage, the things that were going on and, uh, you know, kind of around me. And it was, um, I had more clarity and more calm than I had ever had in my life. Uh, so, you know, at that point I was thinking, well, you know, I may need to go back, but I have not had to go back since. And I've That's come through, yeah, I've come through some really hard circumstances this last couple of years and I'm going to be three years, uh, in remission. And certainly, you know, the <laughs> wow. things I've come through have been stressful. Yeah. Divorces are stressful. Moving, buying a house, selling a house, stressful. Changing careers. But, I mean, sounds like that might yeah, be something changing, yeah. that you're going through too. Went, went back to work, you know, went back to, yeah, went back to work, um, you know, kind of let go of a lot of big expectations around my, my writing life. Um, and I, uh, I gotta tell you, man, this, this, you know, and then on top of all that, of course, these mind, mindfulness took me down a rabbit trail and I started listening to Alan Watts. And then from Alan Watts, I discovered this psychologist named George Pransky. Um, and from there, this Canadian welder named Sidney Banks. And, um, and there's, a, there's a new kind of movement within psychology that started in the 70s around the idea that we are, we, our, innate, our well-being and our resilience is innate within us, and we're born with it. Mm -hmm. And it just gets smudged as we go through life, right? It gets dirty. Um, but it doesn't leave us. We just have to find it. And we spend so much energy looking outside of ourselves for that. But it's actually, it's just, you know, it's like looking for your keys in the parking lot when the last time you saw them was in your house. Um, you, so, so going, you know, so on top of the blocks, you know, which were really helpful from the medical side, um, the cognitive, that gave me kind of more cognitive capacity. And I've been able to... Um, just get a much better understanding of where stress really comes from in the first place. And, and mm -hmm. the idea that it's not really from coming in from outside of us and PTSD is, is it's distortions in our, our in our anxiety response and in our th based on distortions in our thinking um, that I, you know, I think need, I needed a medical kind of reset, but the cognitive piece has really made it so that this last year or two, I've just never, I've never had this much peace of mind, right? I have a great deal of calm in my life that I've not experienced before, which is why I kind of don't care how I live out the writing <laughs> career stuff right Sounds now. Sounds amazing, right? honestly, the, the peace of mind. I feel much better. I feel so much better. And, um, and you know, I think that that's going to reflect whatever I do next in writing. I think it'll show up there. I think that it'll, you know, it'll be there too, so. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely understand your feelings of, what you call it cognitive cognitive dissidence when your children dissidence, were born yeah. oh yeah uh, yeah my when my children were born i definitely had this moment of realization of death mm -hmm. that it was coming oh, yeah. yeah i mean these things That's come from nothing right yeah and i didn't see i didn't I'm, I'm going to I didn't not. have that experience. I, oh, that, you know what? I did have that, that biological, there's this kind of snapping in place in my head where I suddenly realized that nothing else mattered more than them surviving beyond me, that they, that they were, they were how they're, how they're, where they're, how humans keep going. Yeah. And, and so they, I did have that moment and it was this life changing, you know, first time I heard Lizzie cry, uh, you know, it was, it was, so it was pretty powerful and, yeah, I love being a dad, man. That's but yeah, I'm 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 enjoying it a lot more this last couple of years with the more peace of mind, you know, kind of <laughs> And they're able to talk to you and be with you and hang out with you and give you ideas and yeah. chill with you and yeah. you can be a dad and my kids are just we, to get to that point and 
They're not yeah. cool yet. They're still big pains in the butts with sticky hands, and I'm waiting for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it does. It, uh, but, you know, pretty soon you're going to be fussing with them over, you know, not turning the, you know, I mean, deal with, you get a mountain of toothpaste on your bathroom counter um, that's, that's, that's calcified, um, you know, or, or the shrill shrieks of, of discovering ants on the floor. Um, you know, it. But no, I wouldn't trade for anything. I my favorite part of my life is being a dad, and being yeah. a writer is awesome. But you know, I have I asked I you know, what I, you're what you're doing hmm. in combination with being a writer. What 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 are you what doing? Am with I the doing counting? as far as work? Yeah. Oh, I'm I am a senior procurement analyst. Um, a senior procurement analyst, and that that means that I help I help uh, buy stuff. Okay. Um, and so that's what I was doing before. I went to the county in 2000. I, I spent a decade in the nonprofit sector running nonprofit orgs. And then I went to the county in 2005 as a contract specialist. And then six months later, became a senior procurement analyst and then left after eight years. Um, and then, you know, did four years at home and then came back as a contract specialist. And nine months later, moved back into the job, the the classification I was in before. So now I'm in the IT. I'm up in the Department of County Assets and I'm helping with IT purchasing. And I'm enjoying it. It's, you know, it's, I, and I, there are a lot of people there that I knew from when I was there before. So it's, it's just kind of like a homecoming. Um, I, I love, love, I've, you know, I've always been a, uh, but at least for the last decade or so, I've typically, when I've had a job, I've enjoyed my job. So I, I do. Well, like, I mean, when you when you go from the lonely work of staring at a monitor, punching in letters and words and sentences and paragraphs, to working with people, it's definitely a different different environment. It's it's got to be I missed, less lonely. I'm an introvert, right? I'm an introvert, yeah. but I missed all those people, so I was glad. And I, I mean, I wasn't that isolated. I was, and I was on a lot of the time. I mean, I was getting some stuff done the first year or so, but a lot of it went into kind of recovery and just kind of keeping myself well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I still had people and I was out playing gigs and I wasn't completely isolated. What, um, times when I was more isolated. What do you play? Pardon? What do you I play? I play uh, guitar. I play guitar. I play harmonica. I do vocals. Uh, what kind of music? Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Kind of an alternative <laughs> folksy, roxy. I'm playing with this guy now who plays um, an eight string. Um, and oh, neat. Kind of. Yeah, we, so we've got kind of a jazz-infused thing going, but not jazz like it sounds jazz. Jazz more like it's there's a lot of improvisation um, on his part as he does these clever things with his synth guitar. And uh, so I, I don't know how to describe it, but if you pop over to either my Facebook wall or to Reverb Nation, there's some there's some music there. There's also some music on YouTube. Okay, I will definitely do that. I'll put the I'll put the links in the show notes too. Um, yep. I don't play any music at all. I'm completely illiterate when it comes to musical yeah. instruments oh yeah i am um, how's your writing how's your writing going are you writing in the space of having twins because i i found it challenging it was very difficult oh. you know what happened to me i was one of those novelists that would start a novel and go oh i need to go back to that other novel and start writing and i would have like you know dozens of novels started up to a certain point but when my wife got pregnant i got really motivated and actually finished something long mm -hmm. i was like very excited about that um, so my kids actually centered me and I'm actually mm. <laughs> engaged yeah. right now. And probably one of the most, I don't know. And are you allowed to call yourself prolific? Um, <laughs> the most yeah, prolific you're writing, writing moments yeah. of my life. Prolific is just writing a lot. It's, yeah, uh, I'm writing really good stuff. If I don't say so myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. you're feeling it. That's good. Good. Just punching out stuff and, and doing it often and nonstop and, I'm for you. not writing it for them yet, but you know, my problem is not ever being the type of writer to reach beyond reach for those no's. You know what I mean? I've never really sent mm -hmm. anything out. So I have a really yeah. big blind side. Yeah. Well, you know, it might be time, man. I'm trying. That's it's what I'm doing. I've got trip. my Excel, sh my Excel sheet out mm -hmm. and I'm Good. starting to reach in, send stuff and see what happens. Good. Have you tried Raylan.com as a market source? I wrote it down when you said it. <laughs> they, they've got he's he, they've got a good thing there, um, and do you know? I mean, it's I treated it like a fishing expedition, right? It's like it didn't matter if what I, I didn't need to catch in order to stay alive. I just went to enjoy the fishing, 
Yeah, and, that's how I feel. So, I just want to know what's wrong. <laughs> oh, what do you, what do you mean? What's wrong with this story that you don't want it? Oh. <laughs> well, this is a better. I mean, have you done? Have you taken your stuff and had a workshop at all? Have you done any of the of the groups? Like, there's some. Yeah, here we've got Cascade Writers where you can go and you'll end up getting lined up with several, you know, you'll have a, a, several people, including at least one pro. Um, there are conventions out here who have, you'll get, you can get like four pros to critique your short stories. Have you, have you tried doing that, taking thing, anything through and getting, getting like feedback from, you know, folks in the page? Um, Well, I'm on Reddit. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what that. Yeah. Uh, there's some, yeah. um, there's some forums and whatnot, but um take it where i can get it basically mm -hmm. no no really big groups or whatnot i get my, de my, might. my degree in creative writing basically mm. oh yeah well if you have a degree in creative writing that's going to help immensely right off the bat because you'll you know, hope. Easy, you know the stuff that <laughs> well you're going to understand the proper use of sentences and whatnot um well then you might i mean if you had if you have that kind of background you may not need it it might just be persistence because again you know i think when i broke in the average number of rejections before you sold was a hundred. Okay. Well, I'm well short of that. I like, that was my biggest thing. I just write and write and write and go, okay, now what? <laughs> well, I also, mean, if, if it were, if I were going to, if I, if, if, if I were doing it, I would probably build into the mechanism, a marketing mechanism, right? So you write, mm -hmm. you revise, and then you submit, and then you write, revise, submit. That's and what I'm trying just to make do. It, part yeah. of the cycle. it becomes the life cycle of the story, right? The story isn't done until it's in the mail. And that, it, that's a very good way to look at it. Exactly. You write it, you put it away, you see? go back to it, you revise it, and then you find a home. Put life it. coaching out. I'm going to start life coaching people. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, do you remember? I don't even know. Do people still make that a career choice? Can people make money with that? Life coaching? I know yeah, people um, are doing. I don't know how much that is. People, people are calling themselves that. I'm yeah, a life no, there's, coach. There's people out there doing it. Yeah, there are the people who do well at it. I mean, you know, that's the thing, right? People who do really well at things, if they do well at it long enough in front of the right people, they tend to excel. Yeah, right. <laughs> <clears throat> so I mean, I, I don't know. I, but I do. I know people that are making, you know, something. I don't know how much they make, but I know people that are you know, combining, patching. You know, they do a little bit of consulting and a little bit of life coaching. Um, and if I, I do I get a no, though, also I get it back and then I look at it again. You know, I'm trying to. Oh yeah, no, don't. Stupid thing. If you get a no, then you just put it in the mail to the next place, unless they okay. specifically say. Uh, if they say to you. Um, I really enjoyed the setting for this story, but I didn't find the character emotionally resonant enough. <laughs> that might be worth, right? Taking that a might look be at. worth stopping and saying, okay, what's they like the setting? So that's cool. What about the emotional resonance? And then that, that would be a time when I might call in another writer, right? And say, hey, would, you know, I just got a rejection back that talked about emotional resonance and I'm not seeing it, but do you see it? And have them look at it. But, and that's, that's really, you have honestly... To go out and that's what the coolest thing about this podcast is. As you said earlier, being an introvert, you know, I'm in my cave, not having any writer friends, but you yeah. know, I, now I have writer friends. <laughs> yes, you do. But, but Brian, you need to get out of your cave and go, you need to probably get into a group of other writers that are trying to break in, even if it's just online. Do you think there are any writers in New York City? I don't even know if we have any I, here. In, in New York, I'm sure, I'm sure there are. But I do think that, I, I think that there is something to be said because well because you have it's a it's your it's a group of your peers right you, yeah. when i went in i had i had my the, the group of my writing peers john pitts was one of them manny frischberg was one of them uh jay lake was one of them um but you know jay was already pretty well established when i met him he you mm -hmm. know he was he was but john and i you know we and manny we were you know, unpublished for our manny was published for nonfiction, but not for fiction and um you know we all kind of have broke in over the years. And then Writers of the Future put me with a group of people, right? Because I'm Writers of the Future number 21 or whatever. That whole group, they're my, part of my cadre. So I have all these people that I've kind of come up with. And that's that group where I've got any number of people that I can go to. Because if you if you came to me and said, hey, could you read this? I just don't have time anymore. I mean, yeah, I, right. I've got I got people that are that I'm super tight with that I'm not even reading for because I just don't have time. Um, but you need what you need is a pack of people whether they're in new york i think if you're in new york city dude i would 
I think that if I were going to go back and be in a writer's group, if I'd find one in New York City, that'd be awesome. Right. Um, but find a group of people that are doing it, you know, find, go to your, if you've got a local science fiction bookstore or let's check online, figure out where the, who does the conventions and see if there's, there's really there probably good are. For that is Facebook hmm. has turned out to be it a fantastic, is. lucrative. Facebook's a environment for that stuff and i don't really <laughs> well, have a facebook account <laughs> i'm well, just discovering you, all of these once you set up pages friend me once you're on facebook friend me up um and uh, but do uh, l yeah look and see i would totally recommend finding a group it can be online but it sounds like if you're in a cave i would go find other writers and hang out with them a little that's the and, goal um, I, i'm not good with people in in person unfortunately and plus i cannot break free to do anything because well, of yeah you got a few years. writing you got schedule few years. and children unfortunately yes, right no now. you you got a little bit of time but when it when you when the when the moment is there finding a community of writers to be a part of is is a, a great gift and you know, um, you know, we are reaching that that the witching hour, so to speak. Yes. Um, and I wanted to ask you about your projects, your YA fiction that you're developing right now. Did you uh -huh. um, want to speak on it? What what exactly are you working on in terms of right now? I have a couple of concepts in mind, but the one that I'm probably going to roll with, I think, um, is called Mandy Dawkins Walks the Shine. Oh, um, great title. You're really good at the titles, by the way, looking through you. your thank bibliography. You. Thanks. And I think that's I think that's what I'm going to do, but I'm not positive yet. I've got another concept that I've also been kicking around, um, but I could just scrap it all and decide to go write a novella uh, set in my in the world of my series. I might decide. I know I've got to write some short stories probably before I do anything. Um, I've got a couple of things, but you know, that's the other thing. Nothing has stuck. Nothing yeah. nothing has popped out at me and said, hey, do this. I've also got a book on PTSD that I'm partway into that I started a couple of years ago. Yeah, I know it's a non it's a nonfiction book that I'm writing with Manny and with Dr. Lipoff, the guy that, that in Chicago. Um, but I've just not had any I've been busy. I've been busy buying a house and moving and, and going back to work and I think that I think over the next year, as I settle, maybe more will happen. I'm also doing, you know, the other thing is I'm doing some free consulting work um, with a, a writing organization up in the Seattle area that I love. Well, as you probably know, I mean, writing is discipline and you've got yeah. your discipline spread in a lot of different areas. So when you're ready to get yeah. your discipline back, I mean, you'll you'll do what you need to do. Where you're yeah, right now, my it, my focus is just in a lot of other places. But when I yeah. have some of that I want, you know, and I just am not feeling the need to push it. I I'm okay. I I'm happy with what I've done so far, and I don't whatever it was that made me feel the need to do 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 do. I know. I just want to yeah. be 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 be. be it's me. Fascinating with the PTSD and the. The, the, I mean, I, what did you call it? The shots? The Oh, the Stelly Ganglion blocks. Yeah. There's a video yeah. um, on YouTube and on my website called Silence of the Chattering Head Monkey. Um, you might. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, and I'll tell you, if you decide, if you dig, dig more into my stuff and you want to do another run in a couple of months to talk more specifically about pizza or PTSD or any of that, I'd be happy to come back. Yeah, I would definitely really enjoy talking with you again. This has been a great sure. conversation and you've been Good. a great conversationalist. I appreciate um, it. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining me tonight. And I do end these conversations with three questions, um, okay. if you don't mind. The first one, don't you basically mind. kind of answered it already, um, kind of workshopping it a little bit. So it comes out a, a little bit rough. But if you had somebody ask you, you know, I want to create, I want to write, I want to do something. My soul is begging me to produce some kind of art. I'm just having a hard time doing it. I mean, what would you tell that person? I tell them to relax. And um, I would tell them to go back over the territory that led them to want that in the first place. So if it was Land of the Lost um, or Star Trek or Star Wars or comic books or a video game, go back and play it for a while. Um, if it was, a, you know, go, go swim in, in a sense of wonder. Um, yeah. swim, swim in the stuff that your muse wants to eat, you know, <laughs> the, the, and, 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 and stay near, you know, stay near the story. Um, because you know, you've got to, you've got to feed your muse. Um, yeah. and that, you know, and if it, a lot depends, right. And some of it also is, are they, are they experiencing, um, sometimes we bind ourselves up with the yeah. patients we create. And, and I think that, um, well, here's a good illustration. I, you know, writers of the future. When you're there for that week in the workshop that you that you get as a part of that, where you're taught by people like Tim Powers and 
you know, uh, Larry Niven, um, <clears throat> and, and, and McCaffrey came and spoke to us. It was amazing. Um, you have to write a story. You have 24 hours to turn around a short story for them, a complete short story. And it's a huge pressure cooker. And I had myself so tangled up over this concept that ended up, I realized, was much bigger and probably needed to be a novel. And I just was locked up. And then I had a sandwich and I took a shower. And suddenly I had a story in my head. And I sat down <laughs> and, I, and I wrote it because I just, I relaxed, I, you know? So... Um, so I think that's, you know, the big trick to, for, for sustained bursts, right, of life yeah. is to try to relax. Relax. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, second question is easy. What are you reading? Yes. What, are you, what are you reading I am, right now? What are you consuming? I am reading Out of, Out of Your Mind by Alan Watts, which is a series of his lectures. I am reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone with my daughters uh, in the car on Audible. I'm reading The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, and I, I just finished uh, Brainworks, can't remember his name, uh, it's nonfiction brain stuff, and uh, Stranger in a Strange Land by Heinlein. Um, I'm doing a uh, podcast about him not too long into the future. Ah. Just a speculating on speculative fiction deal, my second podcast, going to be cool. Oh, cool. Never actually read anything about him, though. <laughs> That's you like should, the uh, of my life right now. Pick up Stranger, uh, pick up uh, Starship Troopers is probably a good entry point in. You might like it. If I could read right now, I used to be a voracious uh, reader, and now I can't read anything. This is where I, I. This is where Audible is amazing because it's hard to read when you're doing all that. So you can put on headphones. Yeah, um, and have a book going, and it just you have to get your brain back. I mean, once your kids are a little older, your brain will be back better, I think. But oh, you think they've stolen it? Mine, uh, yeah, yeah, I know they did mine. I mean, it was <laughs> tough. It was tough for me to do that kind of stuff while I had you know small kids. So. Yeah, you know, names of things and people just gone. Yeah, I can't pull yeah. them out you're, anywhere. You're yeah, you're tired, man. <laughs> yeah, little kid. Um, yeah, oh my God, I don't remind me. They they're sleeping right now until I go to sleep. Uh, I know. As soon as I crawl back and I crawl on a bed here in a minute, they're going to be like a ride awake. Uh, last question, and uh, this is a simple one also. Where can we find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, www.kenskoles.com, and it's uh, S-C-H-O-L-E-S. Or uh, I still think I have 2,000 spaces available on my Facebook account. So uh, and I'm taking uh, – you know, I prefer, though, if people are going to friend me on Facebook, drop a note and say – Hey, I heard you on Brian's podcast. Is it so that I don't, you know, because I never know when it's going to be, you know, a spammer. So. <laughs> Two thousand spaces. What do you mean? They've, they've um, you can have up to five thousand friends on a on a on a, you know, you can have up to five thousand friends on your Facebook wall. Really? Before you have to switch over to <laughs> also like a business account or something. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, it's not. I don't think it's business. I think it's a. Uh, it's just a different type of account, but I'm, I'm not interested in having that other kind of account. I'm basically going to just keep it, you know, keep what I'm doing. And then there are like 5,000 people can basically hang out on my wall. Man. Well, if 2,000 people from my podcast hit you up, I will be like shocked beyond belief. Right? That means I'm doing a so, lot better than I thought I was doing. Exactly. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, but you may, you know, we may, there may be, there may be a couple, but the, but the offers out there and the same goes for you too. You know, you, if you ping me, Make sure you say you just say just remind me who you are because if it isn't tomorrow, I'm not going to remember necessarily because <laughs> I've got kids too. All right, my friend, I really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so Thank much you. for letting me talk with you tonight. I, I enjoyed you are, this. You're very welcome. I'm hoping we'll do it again. Yep, absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Right, bye bye. Bye.